Isaiah chapter 61, please. Isaiah 61, we are in our Isaiah series. Mark preached last week on Isaiah chapter 60. And if Isaiah 60 was about how the Lord will beautify His people, Isaiah chapter 61 is about who is going to do the work of beautifying His people. Isaiah chapter 61, and we'll read the whole chapter. We'll focus largely on the opening verses, but we'll treat uh, the entire chapter, at least in some measure. Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord, God, is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He, that He may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall shall stand and tend your flocks. Foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers. But you shall be called the priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. You shall eat of the wealth of the nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among the nations and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them that they are the offspring the Lord is blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he's clothed me with garments of salvation. He's covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with with a beautiful headdress, as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth, it sprouts. And as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all nations. May the Lord bless the preaching of His Word this morning. Isaiah 61, the year of the Lord's favor. In the year 1865, Abraham Lincoln delivered his second inaugural address as President of the United States. He anticipated the end of the Civil War and sought to set the stage for peace. So he very beautifully said in that address these words. With malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Moving words. In the year 1933, 
Franklin Roosevelt delivered his first inaugural address as President of the United States. He wanted to take active measures to end the Great Depression, and in the address, he set the stage for new legislation which would give work to the nearly 30% of the workforce that was unemployed. So he said with great confidence and no small amount of eloquence, this great nation will endure as it has endured. We will revive and prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. Dynamic words. In the year 1961, John Kennedy delivered his first inaugural address as president. He was aware that he was the youngest president ever elected. He sought to challenge a new generation to sacrificial public service for the nation and for freedom. And so, my fellow Americans, you know this one, ask not what your country can do for you, ask famous words. We know them. Well, in the year A.D. 28, or thereabouts, Jesus Christ delivered His inaugural address. Not as a mere president of the United States, but as the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. And as Romans 9, 5 says, the Messiah over all, blessed forever. Amen. Like Lincoln and Roosevelt and Kennedy, Jesus set the stage for his coming initiatives. And his words were the opening verses of Isaiah chapter 61. Upon first reading of the chapter, Isaiah 61, it's not unreasonable for us to think that Isaiah spoke here of himself, or perhaps himself along with the other Old Testament prophets. Certainly Isaiah and the other prophets were anointed by the Spirit. Certainly they were sent by God. Certainly they brought a message of good news. They helped bind up the broken-hearted remnant in exile. They announced a coming liberty to the captives. They proclaimed a coming year of the Lord's favor. So it's not wrong for us to see in Isaiah and the other prophets a partial fulfillment of these verses or to imagine how this chapter would have been such a tremendous encouragement to the remnant in Babylon and then 70 years later to the returning exiles who were coming to rebuild Jerusalem. But clearly, that is not the fundamental sense or focus of our passage this morning. Isaiah already introduced us to the anointed one, to the one upon whom the Spirit rests. And it's clear from those words that he's speaking primarily of someone else. So we look at Isaiah 11. There shall come forth a shoot from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So the anointed one, the one anointed by the Spirit here is not Isaiah himself, but rather one who comes from the future royal line of Jesse's son, which is David. The one upon whom the Spirit rests is clearly a king. He's a king. Well, Isaiah spoke of him again in chapter 42, verse 1. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, 
and he will bring forth justice to the nations. So the anointed one here is the chosen servant described in Isaiah chapters 40 through 55. Thus the coming king and the coming servant and the coming anointed one, the coming Christ, are one and the same person. On this side of history, we know that it was Jesus. And that's why we call him Jesus Christ, Jesus, the anointed one. Well, the Lord anointed Jesus with the Spirit at his baptism. And a voice came from heaven and said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Resonates with Isaiah 42, my chosen in whom my soul delights. After his baptism, he was taken by the Spirit into the wilderness and tempted by the devil there, using the Word of God, wielding the sword of the Spirit. He, he emerged without sin. And immediately after that, he began preaching in the synagogues around his hometown. And we'll pick up the narrative in Luke 4. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. They stood for the reading of God's Word. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. That doesn't mean he was done. It seems as if they stood up for the reading of God's word and sat down to preach it. Interesting. We may get to that if, if, if I keep preaching many more years. <laughs> so he sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, I hear this, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. This was no ordinary, ordinary exposition of the biblical text because astonishingly, Jesus claims to be the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, which means he claimed to be the Messiah. What we have in Luke is not the whole speech. He went on to say many other gracious words and people were moved. They were amazed and blessed at his speech. So let's look at the specific elements of the speech to learn what initiatives his reign were going to be about. What is he going to do now that he's been anointed? Now that he's been set in, what are his initiatives? What's he seeking to accomplish? Why has he been sent? And let's look at those one by one. We'll go fairly slowly through these. First, his, his first objective was to proclaim or announce or preach the good news. Well, what good news is that? Well, it's the good news that the everlasting kingdom of righteousness and peace and joy has finally arrived in him because he is the promised king of that kingdom. It's the good news that the servant has arrived who would make his soul an offering for sin so that through his offering, transgressors might be counted righteous. That's good news. It's the good news that despite our ongoing rebellion, despite our careless and grievous sins, despite our determination to move away from God and towards Satan, which we're continually inclined to do, 
God nevertheless loves us and will, through this anointed one, make a way for sinners to be reconciled to God and to receive back forever all that was lost in man's descent into sin. And that's really, really good news. He came to proclaim good news to us. And we notice that this news is for the poor. What Jesus proclaims is not received as good news to the rich. It's not perceived as good news to the self-sufficient or the self-exalting or the self-righteous. It's not good news to the ears of those whose hands are full of riches and whose hearts are full of themselves. We've seen this in Isaiah before. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with who? With him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. So Jesus says of the rich, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples responded and said, well, what hope is there then? And Jesus said, well, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. So if you're rich this morning, with God all things are possible. And he can cause your heart to be contrite. The gospel is good news to the afflicted, to the destitute, to the lowly, to the poor. The gospel is wonderful help indeed to those who know they need help. Along these same lines, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. For they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So the Spirit of the Lord was on Jesus to preach good news to those in poverty and emptiness, to those in soiled clothes and uncleanness, to those in weakness and in helplessness. And He promises to make them rich and full. He promises to clothe them in clean robes of righteousness. He promises to make them strong and fruitful. So his first initiative was to proclaim good news, that good news, to the poor. His second initiative was to bind up the brokenhearted. Jesus was anointed by the Spirit and sent by God to heal broken hearts. to bind up wounded hearts. Now this speaks fundamentally to those with wounded consciences, and I don't want to miss this. It speaks more broadly as well, but it speaks most definitely to those whose hearts, whose consciences are wounded and stricken, and their hearts are broken at what they've done with themselves and with their lives. To those who are distressed and disheartened by their own sinfulness. To those who are feeling the sorrow that their sin has brought into their lives and into the lives of others. To those who are living with a gnawing sense of guilt. Mental health professionals know the devastating effects of guilt. Guilt lowers... The estimation of the self, guilt lowers the estimate, esti estimate of one's worth. And we know that saying you've done nothing wrong doesn't work. To say that the conscience is lying to you doesn't work. To say that you're great, oh, you're just great, you're great, you're wonderful, you're great. 
That doesn't work. To say, well, you're worthy. You deserve it. You're worthy. You're worth, the, you're, worth you're, you're gloriously worthy. Don't feel so bad. It doesn't work. Because our consciences know better. Our consciences testify against us. Meds can't silence a wounded, guilt-ridden conscience. They can only turn down the volume. Alcohol or drugs or entertainment can't heal a wounded conscience. Do you know why? Because in moments of sobriety or solitude, your conscience tells you, you ignored my plain warnings and went ahead anyway. Your conscience accuses you of what you did and reminds you again and again because the conscience can't, can't remain silent. It's part of who you are. It's built into the fabric of the image of God in which you were created. Well-meaning people may seek to comfort a heart wounded by a deep sense of its own sin, but they can't heal it. But Christ here says that he came to treat, to bind up, and to heal the broken heart, the heart wounded with an unclean conscience. Now, no doubt there are those in this room who carry with them terrible secrets. You know what no one else knows about yourself. And for some, it's an unbearable burden. It haunts you. Do you long to know what it's like to have a clear conscience? Do, do you long to know what it's like to realize that you're clean before Almighty God? Do you realize what it's like to have that conscience approving and affirming? Oh, it's a glorious thing. It's the burden that Christian got rid of at the cross. Christ has been sent up to bind up the brokenhearted. And you can have a clear conscience before God now and forever because he was anointed to heal the brokenhearted. Now, no matter what the cause of your broken heart, let's broaden it out. Don't imagine that God looks the other way. Don't suppose that what, whatever the source of your brokenheartedness is, that he's ambivalent or complacent. Don't think for a minute that he is without sympathy. Maybe your dream's like a, like a fragile vase, beautiful, treasured. Maybe it lies shattered in pieces on the floor. Maybe today you've been robbed by injustices, the sins of others. And like the traveler, you've been stripped and beaten and left half dead along the roadside of life while the priest and the Levite walk around you. Well, God anointed a man to help you, a man of sorrows, a man acquainted with grief, a man who suffered unspeakable injustices at the hands of others, and he will stop to help you. He's not going to go around you and leave you for dead. He will stop to help you. He will bind up your bleeding wounds. He will carry you safely to the inn, and he will pay the price of it all. Furthermore, he says in our text that he will give you all of this instead of that. Did you notice as we read, you're going to get this instead of that? This instead of that. This instead of that. Let's take a look at those. God says that he will grant, instead of suffering, he will grant blessing. Instead of affliction, he will grant glory. Instead of ashes, mourning, grief, he will give beauty. Instead of weeping, he will give the oil of gladness. 
Instead of a faint spirit, he's going to give the garment of praise. Instead of multiplied losses, which we heard about in the prophetic word, he gives a multiplied double portion. That speaks of like the, the double portion that the eldest son got of the inheritance. He's going to give you that double portion. Instead of poverty, he's going to give them joy in their lot. They will be rejoicing at all that has come to them by grace. Oh, what a Savior. Now, you know, we who love Christ and have tasted his blessings, we, we know these verses are true. We've begun to experience all of that blessing and all of those insteads. We can testify in no uncertain terms that we are now immeasurably richer. Amen. And even though we still suffer afflictions of every kind, even though tears of sorrow still flow, we know that the very afflictions we suffer now in hope and in faith, trusting the Lord, are working for us an eternal weight of glory. They're working for you an eternal weight of glory. We know the day is coming when every teardrop of sorrow ever shed will be swallowed up in an ocean of joy. He binds up the brokenhearted. Well, he proclaims liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison doors. Jesus declares in his opening address that the Spirit of God is upon him to liberate the captives, to release them from their bondages. This certainly had application for God's people who were held as captives and prisoners in Babylon. It speaks of their eventual liberation. It gives hope to all those who have ever, ever been in slavery. The American slaves took great hope from these verses that by the power of Christ they would be delivered. So it applies to the people in Babylon, speaks of their liberation, but more fundamentally, it, implies, it applies to Jesus for all of us who are held captive by sin, by Satan, and by death. Ever since the fall of man, we have been subject to a lifelong slavery. We've been held captive by sinful desires, unable to consistently do the good We've been held captive by Satan to do his will and unable to free ourselves from his enslavement. We've been held captive by death and the fear of death, unable to, to escape its, its, its haunting, harrowing inevitability. Death approaches for all of us. But Christ liberates us from the slavery of sinful desires, giving us a new heart with new desires and the power of the Holy Spirit. He liberates us from slavery to Satan so that when we resist him, he must flee because the Spirit of Christ is in us. And he liberates us from the fear of death. Jesus proclaimed, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Amen. I learned it in King James. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me, shall never die. Amen. Wow. And laying aside these mortal bodies, we will go from life to life. Maybe you're a Christian this morning, you'd say, man, I'm certainly not feeling liberated today. I'm not feeling very free. I don't feel free from sinful desires. I don't feel free from Satan's bondage. I'm, I'm, I'm in bondage again. I'm having a terrible time getting out. And I'd like to ask you a question. Is it possible that you've forgotten his promises? Are you forgetting the truth that sets you free? You remember Christian and Hopeful in Pilgrim's Progress, foolishly wandered off the straight and narrow road, thinking that they found an easier way. Maybe that's like you this morning. 
Well, they ended up being captured by a mighty and an evil giant. They had trespassed on his territory, and they were put in his stinking dungeon of despair. Do you remember how they got free? Let's read it. I rather like the original Old English. Let's read it. Let's read Bunyan's original words and see if you can track with the meaning. Well, on Saturday, about midnight, they began to pray. It's a good thing that, that Christian and Hopeful were together. And that's part of the key to our being released from our prisons. Make sure you're walking in fellowship with other Christians. Well, they began to pray, and they continued to pray till almost break of day. Now, a little before it was day, good Christian, as one half amazed, break out in passionate speech. What a fool, quoth he, am I, thus to lie in a stinking dungeon, when I may as well walk at liberty. I have a key in my bosom called promise, that will, I am persuaded, open any lock in doubting castle. Then said hopeful, that is good news, good brother, pluck it out of thy bosom and try. Take it out of your pocket and put it in the lock. And if you've read the story, I assume most of us have, the key of God's promises set them free. So as a matter of application, let me just say that whatever dungeon you are in, find the keys. Find the keys in the promises that you've been given. Get in the Word. Find a word, find a verse, find a passage that relates to your particular bondage and memorize it. Learn it, memorize it. Commit it to your heart. And let that truth from Jesus set you free. Well, the next initiative Jesus announces is to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This speaks of a time of favor like the Jubilee year in the Old Testament law of Moses. In that year, all the people's debts were canceled. It was the 50th year when all the people were given back their land, which may well have been lost by their indebtedness. This proclamation that, that the anointed one is going to proclaim a year of God's favor would have given hope to the exiles, would have given them hope of a return to their land lost by their great debt of sin. But this speaks more profoundly of nothing less than the return to mankind of everything we lost in the fall. We forfeited our inheritance when we joined Satan, Satan's rebellion. Jesus came to preach the year of God's favor. In other words, He came to preach a season of time when all debts would be canceled, when we receive back all that was ours from the beginning. He came to proclaim the year, a long period of God's favor, a long period of His grace, a season of happy and glorious redemption. Brothers and sisters, we're in that season now. But the next line, and we always find this in Isaiah, it doesn't matter what chapter we're reading, we can have all these glorious promises, but there's always a warning. And here it is. The next line speaks of the day of vengeance of our God. Now, when Jesus rose in that synagogue and preached from this text, he stopped with the year of the Lord's favor and said, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. That's because he wasn't going to fulfill that part in his first coming. He didn't come to bring vengeance during his first coming. He didn't speak of the coming day of the vengeance of our God because that's not what his mission was about. His first coming marks a long season of God's grace and favor, a year. And his second coming marks a short time of his vengeance, the day of the Lord, the fearful day of the Lord. And it's symbolized as a day. It will be short. In verses 3 then, as we're moving through the text, in verses 3 through 6, 
the anointed one continues to say what he will accomplish. And as I read this, I found myself praying that the Lord would accomplish these things in us. He will plant his people and make them strong like, like oaks of righteousness that he may be glorified. Lord, make us strong like oaks, oaks of righteousness, that you might be glorified, O oh Lord. He will empower them to build up what was ruined. Lord, strengthen us to build up what's been lost. He will enable them to restore the devastations of previous generations. Lord, help us to do that. Where previous generations have missed it, help us to restore those devastations. He will make them priests of the Lord to the nations. Lord, make us priests to the nations. Let us stand between the nations who are perishing and Almighty God and let us proclaim the gospel to them. Make us priests of the Lord to the nations and do it in a way that will draw them, draw the strangers and the foreigners to us so that they can joyfully join in the work and they will bring the wealth of the nations into the house of the Lord. Well, then in verses 8 to 9, the Lord himself speaks. We've heard from the anointed one. Now it seems as if God himself speaks from heaven. And he says that he loves justice, that he hates robbery and wrong. He says that all wrongdoers will receive recompense. And I believe he's speaking there of recompense for having oppressed God's people unjustly. He says that he will make an everlasting covenant with his people and that he will make their offspring forever known as those who are blessed of the Lord. Well, this is a different kind of offspring as Jared taught us some weeks back. What a relief this was to Isaiah. Think for a minute of their situation. Isaiah was writing this at a time when all seemed lost. The people of God weren't just in decline. They had been in decline for a long time, and the Lord was done. He was going to deal with them and send them out of the land for their grievous and great iniquity. Everything seemed lost. You talk about being on the downgrade. They were on the downgrade all the way down. It was a disaster, and he and the faithful remnant were living in a time of disaster. And it's as if to encourage Isaiah and the faithful remnant that God lets them listen to the Messiah's inaugural address ahead of time. There is one coming, and this is what he will do. Don't be discouraged, Isaiah. Don't be discouraged, faithful remnant. This is coming. So the end of Isaiah, when we get finally to verses 10 and 11, Isaiah himself is speaking, and we sense his great relief and his joy. These last verses are pure doxology. They're pure praise and exaltation of God. The words of the anointed one, which the Lord gave to Isaiah, so lifted his faith and so lifted his heart in the midst of a terrible season, a terrible time, that we see Isaiah, the man, we see Isaiah, our brother in Christ, filled with joy and worshiping. And what's the first thing that he's grateful for? He's grateful for his own salvation. The Lord is going to do this. And somehow, amazingly, I'm part of it. I'm included. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, he says. My soul shall exalt in my God. Why? He's clothed me with garments of salvation. 
Brothers and sisters, when we gather every Sunday, we should rejoice that we have been clothed in garments of salvation, that we're included in the people of God. Our voices should be lifted in praise to Him. We're on the other side of the Messiah's coming. We've seen Him. We've seen the cross. How much more should we exalt in our God. He's clothed me with garments of salvation. He's covered me with a robe of righteousness like a bride and bridegroom on the wedding day. It's like Isaiah. Where does that come from? I believe Isaiah is in the spirit as he is magnifying God, as he's praying God, and he is somehow in the spirit caught up in the joy of a great future wedding. That wedding to which all weddings point, he's caught up into the day of that great future marriage supper to which all wedding receptions point. He's caught up in that day when Christ is forever united with his betrothed, with his bride, the church. And Isaiah's there. And his soul exalts in God. The very last verse, wonderful verse, Isaiah's rejoicing in this, that Israel, though they are in great decline, though they've hit rock bottom, though they're being driven out of the land, that they will not fail. Four, last verse. As surely as the earth produces plants when a garden is sown, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations, all the peoples, every ethnicity. This people will be used of the Lord to cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all every nation. How's he going to do that? How how is God going to accomplish that? He'll do it through the anointed one. He will do it through the Messiah. He will do it through Jesus Christ. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Let's praise him.